And Senator Marco Rubio is someone who understands this and has been a warrior for this. He's someone who understands the challenges that are faced in the Indo-Pacific as someone who's led a nation that lives in the Indo-Pacific. We are very grateful for the friendship we've had with the United States and so many other like-minded nations who understand this challenge. And despite meeting the many other challenges that the United States has, whether it's in Israel today or Ukraine, they remain heavily focused on the challenges within the Indo-Pacific, whether it's countering the economic coercion or ensuring that the military support and security partnerships are in place to provide that counterbalance to protect and preserve freedom within the Indo-Pacific. This is what Marco Rubio stands for. And so it's great that he will be standing here at this very lectern tonight. And could you please join me in welcoming Senator Marco Rubio. Thank you. Welcome to uh, Washington. Everything's going great here, as you can see from... We are... Um, but it's great to, to be with you and, and, and to be a part of this. And um, I appreciate those comments very much. You know, I, I, um, I never viewed myself as an anti-China person, per se, although they have sanctioned me. I mean, there's a couple countries I can't go to around the world, according to the leaders. Some I had no plan to go to, like Nicaragua or Venezuela anytime soon. Um, and China's one of them. I had no plans to go to China to begin with. Um, but um, so I don't, then they sanctioned me or whatever, not just the travel ban. And I, I kept wondering when are, the, when are I going to feel the bite of the sanctions? I don't know what they sanctioned. Uh, my Amazon packages are late sometimes. I think maybe that's that. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll blame that on them. But, um, but I've never really, and, and I appreciate those comments, that, that's really not what this is about. And what I really wanted to share with you tonight as I came here and I was thinking about this over the last couple of days is how so many of the, I try to tell people in the United States all the time that many of the challenges we are facing and many of the choices we are now being forced to make, strategic choices about our public policy, are not really unique to the United States. In fact, virtually every Western industrialized, virtually every advanced industrialized society in the world is facing pretty much the same choices. And so it causes you to go back and understand a little bit about how we got to this point. So this is very simplistic. But it is the best way I can explain it to people. I'm a product of the 1980s. I was raised in the 1980s. Everybody, anybody watch that program? I haven't watched every episode. I just watched a few. Of the, it's called uh, Stranger Things. Have you seen this? Anybody saw this? Apparently everyone's seen it except for me. It's like, oh, you haven't seen this thing? I don't, I don't, it's like the nine seasons. I don't have nine seasons. But, um, but it's based on the 1980s. It makes you nostalgic about that period of time. You know? and, and, uh, and I'm a product of that era. So I was raised in a world, talking about early 80s, mid 80s, where our whole viewpoint was that the United States and the free nations of the world are confronting the Soviet Union and the spread of communism, and that's really what everything is about. And then literally, within a year of me leaving high school, my first two years of college, all of it changed, not over a period of time, like just rapidly. Now, I'll confess, my first couple of years in college, I wasn't that focused on geopolitics, but I knew, <laughs> I heard that some wall came down, you know, I heard that the Soviet Union had literally collapsed. I do have some recollection of that period of time. I, I make it sound like I wasn't that bad, okay, but I'm saying I, I was aware that things were happening, but it was a dramatic moment in the world. I mean, understand, we had built all these institutions, all of our public policy, basically our entire political consensus in America, in the West, on this notion that the, and, and there were still voices. I, I say this, I don't know where this poor guy is now. I was at the University of Florida. I say this poor guy. I shouldn't say this because he was pro-Soviet. He was my professor too. And, um, and this guy, I mean, our semester started and he was basically, the gist of the class was the Soviet Union is going to overtake the United States. This was whenever the semester started. And as the semester went on, the Soviet Union collapsed in the middle of this course. So this poor guy's entire life work was crumbling on a daily basis. He was not in a good mood. I don't know what I got in the class, but um, suffice it to say that that's how dramatic this was. So here we are. The Cold War literally is over, and not over a period of 10 years, like in a period of a year and a half, two years, all of this. And, and here's the hubris that takes over, and that is the Cold War's over. Freedom won. Marxism lost. 
And now everyone is going to become a democracy and everyone is going to embrace free enterprise. And that was the promise. That's what everyone was told and everyone bought into. And it's a great thing to feel, like it's the end of history. Well, I can, you look back at some of the comments that were made at the time. There were things like, um, no two countries that have a McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. You know? and, and, um, and the theory behind, you can pick a number of companies a com to say the same thing. But the theory was that once countries start engaging in global commerce with one another, they'll never go to war because there's too much money at stake. That was one theory. And then the other was, you know, everyone's just going to naturally become a democracy. And so many things that we look back on now, and I understand that feeling at the time. I wasn't in public office. Most of the people in this room were not in public office at the time. But um, I understand the desire to feel that way, that sort of euphoria about that moment. But I think as we look back, we can now understand how ahistoric that viewpoint was and how naive. Ahistoric because in the history of this planet, which we now have about 5,500 years of recorded history on, maybe a little more, there has never been an era in which the whole world looked exactly the same. And so this idea that somehow everyone was now, that all of a sudden after 5,500 years, humanity had advanced to a point where everyone would be exactly the same was absurd. Was, was just not... The second is it ignored human nature. And human nature was... Uh, evidences itself in many cases by the uh, emergence of the nation state. Nation matters. Country matters. And in some cases, especially for Americans, it's very difficult to perceive this. We are about 240 some years old. As Americans, we struggle to remember what happened you know, a couple of years ago in our history. It's, we cycle very quickly. But not every society is the same. The Chinese are well aware of their history, which goes back over a thousand years. They view the last hundred years, frankly, as an aberration. The Russians are certainly deeply imp impacted by history. In many parts of the world, history continues to... You cannot understand their political decisions unless you understand history, and, and you understand their history in particular, even within countries and regions within countries that manifest itself. And nation-state has always mattered. And so this notion that we were sold and everyone was told that from now on the market is now going to take the place of nation-state, that now countries will have to react on the best interest of the market as opposed to the best interest of the nation-state, completely ignored the reality of human nature. And, but decisions, important decisions were made in that regard. And as the years played out, that neither the Chinese nor the Russians nor the Iranians, for that matter, beginning in 1979, bought into any of this. For the Chinese, they viewed the world order, and they didn't view a world that they wanted to join. They viewed a world that was structured by the West in favor of the West and that discriminated against them. They believed that their rightful role in the world was to once again be not a powerful country, but the preeminent power on Earth. And they were willing to work 50, 60, 70 years to achieve it. And they were also strategic about how they did it. Not so much these days, but back in that time, it was about hide your strength and bide your time, right? A famous phraseology. It wasn't long ago that they were, well, they still make the argument that they're a developing country. It's a little harder to make it now, but until very recently, it was a, a key part of their dynamic. But they looked at the world and they looked at all these institutions that had been created after the Second World War, which had led to the outbreak of things like prosperity and democracy in many parts of the world, including in the Indo-Pacific. And they viewed it as a system that they would benefit from all of its good things. They would take all the benefits, but they would never intended to live by any of its responsibilities. Again, I'm speaking from an American perspective. This may very well reflect some of what you have faced in your own countries. But what we were told by leaders of industry was, don't worry. Don't worry if the Chinese are cheating. Don't worry if their companies have protected access to their markets but they don't allow your companies to come in. Don't worry if they invite your companies to come in, but they make you partner with one of their companies until they figure out what you do, and then they put you out of business. Don't worry about any of this. Don't worry about the fact that they subsidize companies, so it's not real competition. Don't worry about any of it, because once they get rich, they're going to become just like us. And it probably wasn't until the mid-2000s when there were finally voices in American politics that started to say, I don't think they're changing. I don't think they're adjusting the way you thought. And in many cases, they weaponized both our democracy, but especially capitalism against us. They understood, for example, that if you are, and, and I believe in free enterprise, but if you're the CEO of a corporation, your number one obligation is to return value to your shareholder. That's what you're judged by. How much money can you make? How much can you increase the value? 
And they understood that if they could give you either the reality of a little taste of their large market or the prospects, that potentially one day you may be able to participate in their market, they can then send you back to Washington so that you can talk to members of Congress and in the White House and explain to them why the United States should not crack down on all the unlawful, unfair things that China is doing. And they've deputized, they deputized that to great effect. And so suddenly we come to this realization that after all of these years that we have built on the assumptions that the market was going to displace nation state, we had also made some decisions about the market. We had decided, and I'm a believer in the free market, I would imagine everybody in this room shares that view. Here's the fundamental question that we're now confronting in the West and around the industrialized world. What happens when the market outcome, which will always be the most efficient outcome, which is why I believe in the market, generally should prevail? Because it is not going to waste your money. It is going to put money and investment in the most efficient place where you can get the highest return for the lowest investment. And that's generally the kind of behavior you want to see. But what happens when the market outcome is not in the national interest? Because for a long time, people told us that was impossible. If it's good for the market, it has to be good for America. It has to be good for your country. But we are now faced with the reality that that's not always the case. It's not always the case for two reasons. The first is it's not always really a market. If your competitor or our competitor in one of our companies or one of your companies is a Chinese company, that is not a market competition. That is a state-supported and subsidized entity versus that, that is allowed to undercut your pricing versus a free enterprise entity that does not enjoy state support. That's not a market competition. Somehow we pretended like it is. Then I still have people that argue with me, well, that's, the market is always going to be good for the country. Not always. For example, the market outcome says it is cheaper. It is more efficient to depend on China for 88% of the active ingredients in our pharmaceuticals. I assure you, it is not in the national interest of my country to depend on China for 88% of the active ingredients in the medicines that keep Americans healthy and alive. But that is the case today. It is not in our national interest to allow important industries to leave this country and deindustrialize not just the US, but increasingly the West, because in a time of crisis, how can you provide for yourself these key things from armaments to technology? You look at rare earth minerals. They're actually not that rare. There are plenty of places in this world where you could exploit it, but you can't. Because the Chinese companies that do it, both in China and around the world, are subsidized. No matter what price you set, they will undercut the world price. They will make it, from a capitalist standpoint, unaffordable to invest. You cannot invest in an industry in which the price is lower than your costs. And yet they will assure that that is the case to keep you from entering that. And so we depend on them for these very important elements with, without which much of the technology we rely on, not just in everyday life, but in our national defense, is critical. So there are a number of instances. And then there's one that I don't think is talked enough about. And that is the loss of good paying jobs. I speak only from an American perspective. Perhaps you will see this reflected in your countries as well. Your economy needs to produce wealth, but it can't only produce wealth. It has to produce wealth, but it also has to produce good-paying jobs. And the reason is because good-paying jobs is not just about what you can afford to buy. People are more than just consumers. Good-paying jobs is what allows people to have dignity and purpose. Good-paying jobs is what provides people stability and security. It is what allows people to now, because they have good-paying jobs that they feel secure about, and that they take pride in, it also allows them to now raise a family and invest and contribute back to a community. And I point to family and community for one very simple reason. These are the building blocks of any society. You could have the greatest constitution. You can elect the smartest people. You could have the largest GDP in the world. You will not be a strong and healthy country. You cannot be a strong and healthy society if you don't have strong families and strong communities. Those basic elements of how human beings function are critical to the success of any nation. And you can't have strong families and strong communities if you don't have stable work. And we see that. We see it in our country. If you look at the opioid death epidemic in our nation, it almost, it's certainly at its onset, almost perfectly overlays with parts of the country that were industrialized, deindustrialized, and that lost its good-paying job. 
And I can tell you what the refrain was 10 or 12 years ago, many people were guilty of saying it. Don't worry that the job your dad had and your grandfather had and you just had just went away. A better job is coming and it's going to pay you more. You just have to learn how to code and move to California. Well, a lot of these people are never going to learn how to code and they don't want to move to California because their entire family set and their entire support network is in, is in that community. And that's in a national interest too. We're also being challenged by mass migration. Look, my parents came to this country from somewhere else. And I'm grateful every day that Cuba was 90 miles from the shores of the United States and that they came here and were able to settle here because the opportunities I've had would have been impossible had it been virtually anywhere else in this hemisphere. But I think there, there's a difference between immigration, which is a system in which a country decides this is the process by which we are going to welcome people from other places in, and mass migration, which is an uncontrolled event in which every single day between seven and eight to 9,000 people are entering the United States from all over the world. No process, total chaos, and impossible to assimilate into your culture and into your society. Those are fundamental facts. And, I, and you know, this is in no way xenophobic against anyone. It is the reality that any nation, even one as large and as welcoming as the United States is, where still a million people a year become Americans legally through the gift green card process, no nation can absorb mass migration for extended periods of time without having problems in your society, without creating issues. In fact, one of the reasons why we're having a migratory crisis is because migrants have moved to other countries in the hemisphere, and those countries are pushing against it. We actively have several countries in the Western Hemisphere across Central America moving migrants out of their country as they cross from one nation to the next, moving them, pushing them along towards the northern border because they don't want it in their own country because they can't, no society can sustain and, and confront that. And so we, we made these decisions and now we wake up to the reality that human nature is still the same, that the market is no substitute for nation state that the national interest is important in public policy making and has been too long ignored. And we woke up to the reality that now we have a rising coalition of nations who together seek to challenge the world order that was created after World War II and that we all thought would be shared by all mankind after the end of the Cold War. And it's no longer, um, they're no longer partners sort of from an ideological perspective they're actually increasingly coordinating their efforts. Increasingly, you see coordination between China and Russia and Iran and North Korea. By the way, Kim Jong-un today apparently cried. Did anybody see this in the news? You see that he's broke down crying because they weren't having enough children in North Korea? I mean, I don't know if you would have children if you lived in North Korea either. I mean, it's not uh, uh, the most prosperous place. But um, anyway, I just thought I'd make that as an aside. I don't know what's behind the crying or if it's even real. Um, but you start to see this alignment. And if you want to point to all of the problems in the world today, the serious problems that we confront, the security and stability, every single one of them ties back to an authoritarian organization or ideology or regime. What is the source of instability in the Indo-Pacific today? Who is it that's every single day sending Coast Guard vessels and fishing boats and others to challenge the Philippines? Who is it that on a weekly basis, when he's not busy crying, is launching rockets over the heads of Japan and, and bragging about you know, some nuclear arsenal he continues to build? It's an authoritarian regime in North Korea. Challenging the Philippines, threatening Taiwan, now taking over and destroying what was once a vibrant place in Hong Kong, the Chinese. Who is it that started the first land war in Europe since the end of the Second World War, a massive invasion, an authoritarian in Moscow? And who was behind, who was the greatest source of sponsorship for radical terrorists all over this planet? Authoritarian ayatollahs in Iran. Authoritarianism and this alliance of authoritarians is at the core of every significant global security challenge that we face today. And that's not a coincidence. Because what they are, what they are, they are no, these are no longer just nation states that are acting on behalf of what they think their national interest is. These are nation states that are now acting in concert 
to at a minimum create an alternative, if not a replacement for a world order that was founded and built on a set of principles that are, we like to say are universal, but they are also rare. The notion, the idea of what we would describe as human rights, what we would describe, which is different from what uh, G says human rights are, because he uses the same term, but he means something totally different. We would describe human rights as the rights of an individual, that individuals have certain rights as individuals. This country was founded on the belief that these rights come from our creator. And that government's job is not to grant you those rights, but to protect them and to guarantee them. That concept is about 150, 200, 250, 300 years old. Before that, it existed nowhere, other than maybe some philosopher somewhere on a piece of paper, but it had been put in practice nowhere. Democracy. Democracy is pretty new when you look at 5,500 years of history. Almost every human being that's ever lived on this planet and certainly every human being that's lived on this planet until about 265 years ago lived in societies and in cultures where they had no role to play whatsoever on who their leaders were. Power was in the hands of whoever won the last war and whoever had the most weapons and whoever had the power to compel and to force you. You had no individual rights, no right to pick your leaders, not to mention any of these other rights that today we, I think we increasingly take for granted. And so it is, what all of that is to remind us of is that these principles that we believe about freedom and democracy are not just new, they are hard, and they are rare, and they have to be protected in each generation because they will be challenged in each generation. There has never been a time in the entire history of democracy and the entire history of the freedom movement around the world where there haven't been elements around the world willing to challenge it. And there was a brief window of time where for about 25 years the United States was the world's sole superpower. But that was ahistoric. That was never going to last. And it was what has arisen now are multiple countries with the capability of creating chaos and conflict in multiple regions of the world. And at the core of what they challenge is not just an economic order, which benefits them, but the very concepts that we describe about freedom and democracy. In fact, one of the selling points that G makes in his alternative system is we're, we're not going to tell you how to run your countries. We're not going to interfere in your sovereign affairs. We're not going to tell you that you have to, for example, not put Uyghur Muslims in death camps. We're not going to tell you that you shouldn't mistreat people, that you shouldn't invade neighbors. We're not going to tell you. We're not going to be one of these that's going to scold you about this. That's what he is sort of pitching to developing countries around the world. And so it's a time where we face extraordinary challenges both at home and abroad. And I say we, all of us, every nation represented here today faces these challenges because we are living in a moment of rapid, historic change. The world today is changing and developing faster than at any other time. Things that used to take 10 years now happen in six months to a year. And the acceleration of events if there's one thing that I worry about, is the ability of democracies to keep pace with it. What I mean by that is that there are some advantages that these autocracies have. And I say advantages in the context of their ability to respond. So for example, if the Chinese decide that they are going to dominate an industry, they don't have to have a town hall meeting, they don't have to go around and get consensus. They decide, they craft a plan, and then they have the ability over a 10 or 15 year period to pursue it. So a few years ago, they came up with a Made in China 2025 plan. They stopped talking about it when people figured out what it was. But it was basically a plan to dominate 10 industries, some new, some not so new. And they've begun executing on it. In democracies, you have to have a debate about it. You have to have an argument about what it should look like, which one should be the priority, how much money should be spent. If you have a change in government, maybe the plan all of a sudden changes. That's a disadvantage, I think, in their mindset. The other is they really don't worry too much about public opinion, to a degree. Because even in China, at some point, you know, when they were welding people into their homes, people started pushing back a little bit. But up until that point, you know, they, they, they pushed the envelope on that. We, on the other hand, have to constantly, we in the democratic nations, have to constantly react to public opinion and be reactive to it. We can't just ignore it. They would view that as an advantage. They watch the news. 
they see the divisions and the divides in free cultures because we do it out in the open. We call each other names. You know, we argue about things. Uh, they see that, and they see that as a source of weakness and division. They, on the other hand, at least can pretend that they're all unified because, for example, in China, anyone who doesn't disagree, every, anyone who disagrees with Xi is guilty of corruption, right? And so you go away for some period of time, and we stop hearing. Even the richest man in China had to shut up for 30 days because he had opinions, and they don't want opinions. So they would view these things as advantages, and it does allow them to execute on things much faster than democracy. What are the disadvantages, though? And they're pretty substantial. The first disadvantage is, in these autocratic regimes, very rarely do leaders be told the full truth. One of the reasons why Chernobyl happened is because who wanted to call Moscow and say, hey, we melted down the, the, the nuclear reactor, we have a problem. Like, no one got rewarded for that. I'm convinced that no one in China got rewarded for saying, hey, we have a pandemic, we have a virus, you know, it's really spreading fast, people are going to die. Like, that does not get you rewarded. I think we're pretty certain that Putin was told, if we invade Ukraine, the Ukrainians will welcome us as liberators with roses in the streets. And that didn't happen either. And these autocratic uh, regimes, under these autocratic uh, governments, oftentimes what is rewarded is compliance. What is rewarded is telling the leaders what they want to hear, not necessarily what the truth is. And it causes inefficiencies, but it also causes miscalculation. Miscalculation that could lead to conflict, that can lead to invasions, and God forbid, potentially war in, in the Indo-Pacific. So all of it is to say that we today face a challenge. It is true to democracy, to freedom, to all the things we hold dear, but it's much more than just to those concepts. The challenge is to what the world is going to look like. And I think at the fundamental core of it is a decision we're going to have to make. And that is, do we want to leave for our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren yet to be born a world where the most powerful and influential nations are nations that do not believe in human rights, do not believe in individual liberty, do not believe in any of the values that we have frankly taken for granted because we thought they were going to spread throughout the world? Is that the world we want to leave behind? Because if that's the world we leave behind, I promise you, and I don't think I need to convince this group, it will not be a better world. It will be a different one. And the experience of the people who will follow us will be very different than our own. And we'll be condemned for it by history. Because history will talk about a time that looked different. And from all points of view, better. And I guess my concluding point is that I think in, I say this maybe more from an American perspective there's some level of complacency of this belief that somehow everything will always be the way it is. That these things that we cherish and hold dear are natural, that they just happen on their own, and that, yeah, things look bad, bad things are happening, but real threats, they're not going to happen. And when you come to that point of complacency, at some point you don't take it seriously until it's too late, and more importantly, you're not willing to sacrifice for it. Sometimes you see something that's happening halfway around the world and say, well, that, what does that have to do with me? Because you don't see how those things can spiral in an inter increasingly interconnected world that ultimately impacts you down the road. So we have a lot of work to do in the free countries of the world because we face the challenge not simply to the concept of freedom and democracy, but to the very institutions that made it possible. I'm reminded that when we talk to people in the Indo-Pacific, nations and leaders, one of the fundamental arguments is if you look at the, by all accounts, that region is substantially more prosperous than it was just 30 or 40 years ago. There was a time not long ago where South Korea was a military dictatorship and its economy was smaller than North Korea's. It was a massive recipient of foreign assistance. Today, South Korea is, one of the, is a democracy. It is one of the largest economies in the world. And it is a donor state in foreign aid. That didn't happen because they embraced Marxism, socialism, that, that, the Soviet-style socialism. That happens because they embraced the market and democracy, and they were supported by the institutions around the world that made it possible. So what's at stake today in the Indo-Pacific is an example. It's not an American-led order or a Western-led order. It is their order. It is the order they have built. It is the order they have benefited from. No nation benefited from it more than China did. But now they want to dominate it. Now they want tributary states. 
in the Indo-Pacific, and dependencies in Africa, in Latin South America, and in developing countries, where they're able to go in and through debt traps or unfair investments, steal the riches of those countries for their own benefit. That's a real challenge. And the same is true for those in Europe and here in North America. We face a direct challenge that, uh, that we, every single day, continue to benefit from the fact that companies who flourished under our rule of law are dominant in these fields. But that won't be the case in 5, 10, or 15 years, especially in some of the emerging technologies. Do you think if we live in a world where precision medicine, which is the ability to treat conditions at the genetic level, that the Chinese dominate that industry? Do we really think that our world is going to be better off for us when we're depending on them for the treatments that could save lives? And I can go down the list of industries. So all of these things have to be brought together, and it's a time of, of, of a big challenge that I hope we're up to. Because what's at stake is not just the future of America or the future of democracy or the future of freedom as we understand it. What's at stake is what the world looks like. And if we live in a world dominated by these autocratic regimes, where they dominate us not just militarily, but technologically and economically because of the leverage we've allowed them to establish because of our complacency, because of our unwillingness to confront these challenges. If we allow that to happen, then the world will be in a new dark age, unfamiliar to anyone in this room right now, far worse than I could paint. And the only difference is that those autocrats will be armed with technologies and capabilities that no leaders have ever had, not to mention autocratic ones. So this is a, an important moment that I think calls for unity of action. And it's great to see so many political parties from around the world committed to the same cause of protecting freedom and protecting democracy by understanding what's at risk. The institutions and the alliances and the values and the cultures and the practices who made them possible and allowed them to flourish in places they had never existed before. That's the work of this generation, and I hope we get it right for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, and I'm excited for the fact that you're here and that we're going to be working on this together. So thank you for the chance to speak to you. God bless.